Prentice Ingram was born the son in 1843, presumably at Jefferson College, which he attended at some point and where his father was a sometime teacher, thereby becoming Professor Ingram. He's always known by that claim. He would have grown up in his father's cures at Mobile, Aberdeen, and Riverside. As he was 17 when his father died at 41 of an accidental gunshot wound. By then, war was on the horizon, and Prentice left Mobile Medical College, where he, which he must have entered when he was 16, because he was born in, in uh, 1843, and entered the service of the Confederate States. He served with apparent distinction in the war. He was a colonel of a regiment, commander of the scouts in the Lawrence Sullivan Ross Brigade, and I simply recite that. I don't really know what it was. He was wounded and captured at Fort, Hus Fort Hudson, Escaping to take part in the Battle of Franklin, I do know where that is, where he was wounded a second time. After Appomattox, where there was nothing to do but what he did best, which was follow the family tradition of adventuring, Freddie Ingram was the essence, became the essence of a post-war adventurer, cast afloat, as it were, by the destruction of his country. So what was there to do or be but a soldier of fortune? The war was over in April 1865, and Prentice Ingram made for Austria where he served on the staff of General Hoffman in the Battle of Sedova in 1866. I think because that's the name that it's given it, that he was probably serving on the Austrian side, which means he would have been opposing the first one of Bismarck's attempts to straighten out things in Central Europe. And then probably, having gotten interested in things Austrian, he made for Mexico just in time to take the side of Benito Juarez against the Emperor Maximilian. He then fought in Crete against the Turks and the great Cretan rebellion that went on from 1866 to 1869, and was subsequently in the service of Ishmael Pasha, the Khedive of Egypt. <laughs> Obviously, he was looking for it. <laughs> he showed up in London that same year, where he tried to write satires about English society that were not well received. Military flame in the service of the Cuban rebels against Spain, where he earned the rank of captain in the rebel army as well, a curse colonel in the rebel army and captain of <coughs> the Cuban Navy, was captured and condemned to death but escaped again. Now, this is the third time. <laughs> Now, one has the sense that in the early 70s, Prentice Ingram's career was a kind of windless ocean when he hit upon the idea of converting his father's works into the new dime novel format, which he did by mercilessly uh, paring down the, uh, the rhetoric. He would reduce a whole paragraph to a sentence because, because J.H. Ingram's books were uh, fulsome and they were <laughs> use of adjectives Clauses, he knew that you weren't going to sell that too much in the dime novel format, so he began to gin them down. There was plenty of evidence that a market existed now for adventure stories of the West, witness Bret Hart. The luck of Roaring Camp had made his reputation in 1872, and a century later it was still a staple of anthologies and high schools. But the luck of Roaring Camp, with its account of the ability of a baby to civilize a mining camp, appealed to a fairly sophisticated Eastern reader. There is absolutely no indication that Prentice Ingram thought that he was writing for the ages, although his adventure stories are still published and read. I was truly amazed to find this. Anyhow, Ingram chose to write for a reader who was not going to read Bret Hart. He then made an, in an industry for those whose cultural successors are not easy to identify. Perhaps the cultural successor is an avid reader of James Bond. Or perhaps he's the devotee of Ken Follett. But not perhaps a follower of Catherine Ayrd or Marjorie Alligan. Ayrd and Alligan, who are great mystery writers, to the degree that that adjective works, would have been too sophisticated. <laughs> Ingram never had the benefit of Ken Follett's fornicatory device that inserted a bit of raw sex at the point at which the narrative drags. <laughs> the market into which Ingram moved consisted of readers who just liked adventure and who admired the hero for his moral qualities as well as for his death-defying courage. One of the things in all of these, these uh, talks that I've had the privilege of working on that has, it's perfectly obvious that struck me is how different, sometimes in different ways, but how different these people were. 
They were, uh, I, I'll talk about it later in a couple of ways, but they were not afraid of them. Uh, in the sense in which almost everybody in 2009 to some degree is. And certainly uh, Prentice Ingram was not, and his readers at least thought they were not. Thus Ingram began a career founded upon the remanufacturing of his father's novels as dime novels by reducing the turgid prose to neat, swiftly readable style. This effort fit neatly with important events in the history of publishing. The invention of the dime novel with its orange cover and black line illustrations by Beadle and Company of New York in 1860. The dime novel was a development of the story paper, a large sheet of newspaper, which was then folded variously, sometimes into quarto, sometimes octavo size, containing serialized stories for the entire family. The definition of the dime novel is imprecise, for there was a half dime novel and a 15 cent novel, <laughs> but there is a kind of uh, cocoa-like list that has been developed to which collectors refer. The precise definition of the American genre called dime novel is still controversial. Collectors insist that the dime novel can never be a love story. One uh, specialist wrote, dime novels are strictly blood and thunder, where the heroines are meant to be rescued, not kissed. 